Some of you may have heard about a recent police brutality Supreme Court decision. Kiesla v. Hughes, a story that came and went faster than a Trump cabinet member. A woman was reporting as stabbing a tree with a kitchen knife, a crime we generally overlook or else we would have taken down these guys years ago. You left your name at the scene of the crime, come on! Then the police showed up to de-escalate the situation and in the process ended up shooting her four times through a fence, although she's still alive. Which, only four bullets? Wow, the police are really starting to show some restraint. So a court of appeals found the officer guilty, but in a move I haven't seen the Supreme Court take, they just kind of burst in and on Monday reversed the decision without anyone asking, seeking oral arguments, or even getting proper briefings. Believe me, I was scouring the internet for Supreme Court oral arguments in this case, and the best I could do was the Court of Appeals case, which was overturned, so studying that would be like becoming an expert on the leeches section of a medieval medical textbook. Instead, to understand this case, we need to go back to 1984's case of Tennessee v. Garner that answered the question, why can't officers kill people who are fleeing? Now, don't think me ungrateful because I'm glad we figured that one out, but did it really take over 200 years for a good case to finally emerge? The question was over the constitutionality of a Tennessee statute that said, If after notice of the intention to arrest, the defendant either flees or forcibly resists, the officer may use all the necessary means to effect the arrest. So let's get started with the case. We'll hear arguments first this morning in Tennessee against Garner. So again, let's get back to the Constitutional Book Club, also known as the Supreme Court, and ask our judges, what do you think the authors meant when they wrote the Fourth and Fourteenth Amendments? The Fourth and Fourteenth Amendment was were the two bases that the bases that the court used for declaring it unconstitutional. All right. So beyond the First and Second Amendments, things start getting pretty obscure pretty fast. Haven't seen many Facebook posts about the Seventh Amendment, which somehow snuck into the Bill of Rights saying that civil suits of over $20 can be open to trial by jury. Let's hope that a Supreme Court case at some point decided to make that inflation adjusted or else we'd fix the unemployment problem by having millions of people on jury duty every day. Anyways, the Fourth Amendment, which was the one that's against unjust searches and seizures. So how does this amendment that protects people against unreasonable searches and seizures keep officers from shooting fleeing suspects. Well, in the case itself, they barely mentioned the Constitution, instead focusing a ton of time on the discussion of whether a burglary was a violent crime or a property crime, an argument that we'll get into later, although I pretty much just summed it up. So instead, I'll refer to the published decision. First, apprehension by the use of deadly force is a seizure subject to the Fourth Amendment's reasonable requirement. So this might sound like a victory for anti-police brutality advocates, and it definitely is, but it's not saying no deadly violence, it's just saying regulate it. You see, as the law stood in Tennessee, officers had carte blanche access to kill suspects who were fleeing. People who have stolen checks are being shot at by Memphis police. These are the petty, the pickpockets and the petty thieves identified by the Chief Justice and Bivens. Although there were some exceptions that, oh man, well, you'll see. Would you take the same position with respect to a fleeing felon whose felony is an antitrust violation? <laughs> the court please, that, that makes a, a, a difficult uh, question. <laughs> you can't shoot them. Antitrust violations are a white person, a white collar crime. Now that might sound like a joke, but that's actually another problem we'll get to in just a second when we discuss the 14th Amendment problems. Anyways, the court ruled here that the ability to use deadly force to take down a felon under any circumstance was unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. Now, this second problem is a weird one because it revolves around the term common law, which is basically the peer pressure version of the legal system. Well, we've been doing it this way forever, so why change? It and a legacy of racial hatred are the two ways you can tell a country was a former British colony. There was a law on our common law system that said that cops can shoot fleeing felons, which would also mean that it's the position of the state that 
Section 40-7-108 of the Tennessee Code, which is generally an embodiment of the common law rule, as it has been construed over the years by the Tennessee Supreme Court, is constitutional. Although the court in this case saw the Fourth Amendment above this common law, and they said that that was written when weapons were rudimentary, and they saw this common law was being used dubiously by these police forces. Although, I feel like the term dubious is more a word for planning to sneak into an R-rated movie than killing fleeing suspects in cold blood. Oh man, that murder was so dubious. The decision continued by saying, While burglary is a serious crime, the officer in this case could not reasonably have believed that the suspect, young, slight, and unarmed, posed any threat. Nor does the fact that an unarmed suspect having broken into a dwelling at night automatically means he's dangerous. Alright, this might sound like a small point, but this got to the vast majority of the court's focus. The question that kept coming up was, what if there were dead bodies in the house that the officer didn't know about? No exaggeration, they mentioned dead bodies more times than they mentioned the Fourth Amendment. Despite the fact that there were no dead bodies. You know, your classic case of guilty until proven innocent. How can the officer conceivably know, one way or the other, whether there are or whether there are not some dead bodies inside the house? The idea of there being two or three dead bodies in the house came up so many times, I wasn't sure if I had finished listening to the case and the audio had autoplayed to a George A. Romero movie. So what if there were dead bodies in the house? Does the uncertainty of whether someone's murdered someone give you the right to kill them if they flee? But the officer had no reason to believe that there were any dead bodies in the house. And I think that is a, a critical point because the, one of the major differences between our position and the position of the city and the state is that they would premise the right to kill of, of a police officer on what the officer does not know. But this court has held, and I'm thinking of Your Honor's opinion for the court in Brown versus Texas, that the Fourth Amendment requires police actions to be governed by what the officer does know. So this brings us to the 14th Amendment race component I mentioned earlier, which got mentioned exactly twice in this case and was handled about as well as you'd expect from a court case in the mid-80s. Alright, so first mention? And finally, the question whether the, the Memphis policy is uh, in violation of the 14th Amendment because it's racially discriminatory. And the second time. And brace yourselves, everyone, because this one might be equally offensive to African Americans and white Southerners. You didn't get to your third argument, and I just am not clear on one factual matter. Does the record tell us the race of the victim and the race of the officer in this case? In this case, yes. Both were black. Both were black. Both were black. But I would point, Your Honor, to the testimony of the police director that he said, quote, had more problems with his black officers trying to out-redneck his white officers. Where to even begin with this one? First of all, sir, let's not stereotype the redneck minority. Not all rednecks violate the civil liberties of black people. And secondly, the fact that apparently black officers out-violate black people's civil liberties doesn't make this not a race problem. Although, that's how it was treated in this court. In this case, they were trying to argue that the 14th Amendment, which designated black people as people, gave them equal rights. Although this law was allowing officers to racially withhold their Fourth Amendment due process rights at a higher rate than they were other people. But, since it was a black officer, well, that's all they had to say about that. So that's the constitutional section, but there are a few other interesting arguments. For example, What penalty could the state have imposed on him under your code for the crime of not submitting to the officer's demand? Not submitting to the yeah, arrest? just for fleeing. And the maximum penalty for fleeing from an officer under the Memphis Code is $50 fine. Although, the representatives were quick to point out that and the ability of the state to effectively apprehend suspects that are fleeing from felony crimes reflects a substantial interest on the part of the state and does not amount, as has been suggested, to punishment of the suspect. This isn't about punishment or deterrence. It's simply about catching the criminal. Defenders of a court of appeals decision that found this Tennessee law unconstitutional were quick to point a distinction between apprehending a criminal and collecting a dead body. It also means, I take it, that he may deliberately shoot to kill. Well, 
when you say deliberately, Your Honor, yes, doesn't he doesn't mean that. I'm just trying to understand. <laughs> right. Yes, he's he when he pulls his weapon, that's what he's intending to do. So it's really more than apprehending him, then. No, it is apprehending him. That's the purpose of it. Well, it's the attempt to apprehend, and that's the last resort. That's the last thing you, he can do. There was one other important constitutional argument that was made. It's the state's right to dictate police procedure, which is partially true as long as it abides by certain regulations. So can this be legal? Well, as long as it doesn't violate someone's Fourth Amendment rights and due process, or as one justice put it, I would suppose you would agree that the state could not adopt a statute making it a capital offense to flee in these circumstances. Oh, that's, that's correct. That would be unreasonable. There are some limits on the state's uh, right. power. Or because that does show a blatant misunderstanding of the punishment versus apprehending argument, a more technical, less funny reason that this is illegal is... I don't think that, that the Fourth Amendment should allow such a shooting. I think that unless the state interests uh, require it because of the interest of protecting the public, uh, the Fourth Amendment would, uh, should, <clears throat> would, would bar that shooting. All right, so the outcome of this case is that you cannot use lethal force against someone if they do not pose an immediate threat to you or anyone else, and it cannot be a part of your apprehension strategy. So using that definition and everything we just talked about, let's look at what the Supreme Court just did in overturning the Court of Appeals opinion in this case, where the victim brought a knife to a gunfight. Well, in this case of Kiesa versus Hughes, the Supreme Court cited qualified immunity, a term that's used to protect police officers unless their actions violate someone's constitutional rights. Now, some would look at what we just talked about and say, well, what about the due process and Fourth Amendment? Well, here's what their per curiam document had to say. When Kiesla fired, Hughes was holding a large kitchen knife, had taken steps towards another woman standing nearby, and had refused to drop the knife after at least two commands to do so. The question is whether at this time of shooting, Kiesla's actions violated clearly established laws. So you could pretty easily make an argument at that moment that they thought someone's life might have been in danger. They even quote the case we just talked about in their brief, saying basically that because the suspect poses a threat to another person, the officer in this case had probable cause to use deadly force. Now if the conversation had ended there, that would be one thing, but in this case the Supreme Court takes it one step further by declaring qualified immunity. Basically, if a police officer's actions are not overtly unconstitutional, and a reasonable officer in that instant would have taken the same measures, these actions cannot be challenged, because the Venn diagram of cops and Supreme Court callers has a very small crossover. And essentially, when you get into these types of evolving dangerous situations where you're in a constitutional gray area, you don't really have time to whip out your phone and Google the per curiam argument from the 1984 case to determine whether specific times you need to use lethal force or not. Instead, this Supreme Court didn't judge whether the officer had violated the Fourth Amendment, but rather said that, Here the court need not and does not decide whether Kiesla violated the Fourth Amendment when he used deadly force against Hughes. For even assuming a Fourth Amendment violation occurred on these facts, Kiesla was at least entitled to qualified immunity. Basically what that means is, it doesn't matter whether he violated the woman's Fourth Amendment rights or not. The fact that you could make a reasonable argument that he didn't violate her rights is enough to let him off the hook. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hey YouTube, if you want to support independent journalism investigating the Supreme Court, please subscribe to our YouTube channel for a weekly Supreme Court Saturday episode. And remember to subscribe and leave me a comment if you have an important case you think I should research.